This is Julie Jensen. She's with her two sons, David the older boy and Douglas the little boy. As you are aware by now in this case, Mark Jensen, the defendant, stands accused of murdering his wife, Julie Jensen, in 1998 by poisoning her with ethylene glycol, the main ingredient in antifreeze. Now when you have a murder case such as this, you hear evidence in great detail about the person who is killed. So you're going to hear evidence about how Julie's body was discovered dead in her bed at her home. You'll hear detailed evidence about things like how her arm was positioned, the lividity of the blood in her body, how her face looked buried in the pillow. You're going to hear about Julie's blood and what was in it, her stomach contents and her kidneys, and how they revealed the evidence of the ethylene glycol poisoning. And there's two things that you're going to hear in the evidence that you should know about ethylene glycol poisoning. A person should not have ethylene glycol in their system. The human body is made up of all sorts of things, but ethylene glycol is not one of them. So if ethylene glycol is found in a person, that is instant evidence of poisoning. And it has happened that some people have accidentally killed themselves with ethylene glycol, and some people have purposefully committed suicide by drinking ethylene glycol. But in this case, the evidence you're going to hear is that the defendant murdered his wife with ethylene glycol, that this was not Julie Jensen ingesting that substance to commit suicide. And that leads me to the other thing you should know about ethylene glycol. It's a drug that is not commonly tested for at autopsy. At autopsies, there are tests that are done for drugs, like prescription drugs or illegal street drugs. But ethylene glycol, such an unusual substance, is not typically tested for. And so a person doing an autopsy isn't necessarily going to find it unless they're looking for it. So you're going to hear that evidence about the ethylene glycol in Julie Jensen's blood and in her stomach and other evidence of that poisoning in her system. You may even see some photos from the autopsy showing evidence from the inside of her body. So in this trial, you're going to hear Julie Jensen talked about in that way, that detached, impersonal evidence. But this is Julie Jensen. And in this murder case, even more important than how her body was found and what was in her blood and her stomach, even more important than that is the evidence you will hear about Julie the person. You are going to hear from witness after witness, people who knew Julie in various aspects of her life, that her family and her children were everything to her. She even had a specialized license plate on her car, My Three Ds, that stood for her two children, David and Douglas, and the father of her children, the third D, Daddy, that was for Mark Jensen. When Julie Jensen died, her oldest son, David, he was eight years old. He was in third grade at Southport Elementary School. And you, you are going to hear from David's third grade teacher. Her name is Therese DeFazio. And she's a witness in this case because Julie Jensen was very involved in her son's life. She was actually a room mother in this third grade class. And so even though her youngest child, Douglas, he was only three years old and she was a stay-at-home mom, it doesn't mean that she just stayed at home. Every Wednesday morning, starting in the beginning of that school year in 1998, Julie would volunteer in David's classroom to help out Ms. DeFazio. She would help the other students in the class and help Ms. DeFazio with various projects. <clears throat> 
And one thing that Julie Jensen and Ms. DeFazio had in common that you'll hear about in the evidence is that Ms. DeFazio had two sons too, two older sons. And so that was a topic of conversation between them because Julie Jensen was asking her for advice. What do you do with two sons? How do you raise your sons? She was looking towards the future, thinking about college for, for David, a, a very bright child. And Julie Jensen was also a big part of her children's activities. She was the kind of mom who would make Halloween costumes for her kids by hand. She was good at crafts and sewing, and she was a good baker. And you're gonna hear in this case a lot about the neighborhood. The Jensens lived in Pleasant Prairie in a neighborhood known as Carroll Beach, which is near the lake. They had a nice yard with a beautiful garden, a swimming pool, and you'll hear from the neighbors who often saw Julie playing in the yard with the children or neighborhood children coming over to the house because they had the swimming pool. But Julie Jensen also had a life outside her children. Before her oldest son was born, she worked as an assistant at a stock brokerage firm. And even when she was a stay-at-home mom, she wasn't an isolated person. She was outgoing. She went out of her way to meet and get to know her neighbors. She made her neighbors her friends. And you're gonna hear from a variety of neighbors who say that about Julie Jensen. She was also active in a neighborhood book club. You're gonna hear about the book club. The month before Julie Jensen died in November of 1998, she hosted the book club and she invited the ladies in the book club into her home. Finally, she was an avid gardener. Gardening was really her passion. So she would be outside a lot working on the garden. In the week of her death, she called a neighbor just to discuss gardening, some seeds that the neighbor had or had grown. Julie Jensen was looking to purchase that in the future and was asking questions about it of her neighbor. The only real problem for Julie Jensen in the fall of 1998 was with her marriage. But before we talk about that time, the fall of 1998, I want to go back to 1990 and to 1991 in the months after David, her oldest, was born. Now that's a big transition time in a marriage, the time before kids and the time after kids. And it caused some issues in the Jensen marriage. Julie felt that the defendant was not involved enough with David, not supportive enough. And she had returned to work part time after David's birth, and that was a difficult transition too. And Julie Jensen during that time was suffering from some postpartum depression. And she went to a psychotherapist. She saw the, the psychotherapist for about a year. She was prescribed an antidepressant. And the defendant also went to the psychotherapist several times too, because the therapist felt it was useful to see both the Jensen's and these sessions lasted about a year. So in this trial, if you hear about Julie Jensen's history of depression, that this is a suicide because she had a history of depression, well, that's it. The postpartum depression and seasonal affective disorder when the seasons change, like fall, that she was treated for for one year in 1990 to 1991. Julie Jensen did not have a history of suicide attempts. She did not have suicidal ideation. She had no suicide plans. And what a therapist is supposed to do, what you'll hear in the evidence, is ask someone if they have signs of depression to ask that person about risk of suicide. At no time did Julie Jensen ever say she was contemplating suicide. And in fact, she would cite her children. She could never do it because of her kids. And that's what happened in 1990 and 1991. And really what you're going to hear is the problem during that time period was with the Jensen marriage. In addition to Julie Jensen's concerns about the defendant's lack of involvement with David, she just felt the defendant didn't love her anymore. 
and she even contemplated divorce during that time period. Julie Jensen began confiding in a coworker, a man named Perry Tarika. He was going through a divorce and he also had a young child. And one weekend, Julie made the mistake of inviting Perry Tarika to her home on a weekend when her husband was gone. And that weekend, she had sex, she had a fling with Perry Tarika. So she cheated on her husband. Now that's the only time Julie Jensen and Perry Tarika were intimate. And you can tell from the evidence that Julie Jensen immediately regretted this. She cut off the relationship with this man immediately. And she even left her employment where they had worked together. And after that, Julie Jensen decided to not keep secrets from her husband again. And in this trial, I expect you'll hear from Perry Tarika as a witness. I expect you'll hear about this relationship he and Julie Jensen had as co-workers at first, and then confiding in each other about their more personal issues. And you'll hear about during that time period, as Julie was contemplating divorce, she even went with Mr. Tarika to his divorce lawyer. And in fact, in June of 1991, Julie Jensen did file for divorce, though obviously that didn't go through. The reason I am going back to 1990 and 1991 is because that changed everything in the Jensen marriage. You will hear in the evidence that the defendant never forgave Julie Jensen for that affair. And by the way, there's no obligation to forgive a spouse for an affair. That's not required. Sometimes affairs break relationships, they break marriages. When that happens, divorce is always an option. Forgiveness is not required. But Mark Jensen did not file for a divorce. Instead, he engaged in a campaign of covert harassment directed at his wife to degrade her and gratify him. In a case that is full of strange facts, this harassment over the course of years is perhaps the strangest. And here's how it would look. From time to time, starting after Julie's affair, someone would apparently be leaving pornographic images outside of the Jensen home, on the deck, in the shed, even allegedly, mailing these pornographic images to the defendant's place of work and leaving them on his car at work. And so what were these images? Well, almost all of them appeared to be printed out computer photos, so in black and white, on regular paper. Only once was it an actual photograph that was left. And these photos were pornographic. They would show sexual activity, sometimes sexual intercourse, sometimes oral sex, sometimes a woman positioned as though she was about to perform oral sex on a man, and sometimes just naked photos of men with erect penises. Another feature of this harassment was phone calls. Far more than the occasional hang-up call that people got in the 1990s, over and over and over again, call after call of hang-ups. And a lot of this was directed towards Mark, he said, that he would get these harassing calls at work, that he would receive these harassing photos at work. And so over and over and over again, Julie Jensen reported this activity to the Pleasant Prairie Police Department beginning in 1991 after that affair, and all the way through the beginning of 1998, this continued. An extremely long length of time, almost seven years. And this happened so frequently, and Julie Jensen reported it to the police that she actually asked to just speak to one officer, so she wouldn't have to say the whole story over and over again. And that officer ended up being Officer Ron Cosman. 
And so how it would work is most of the images were purportedly found by the defendant. That's what Julie told the police. The defendant would come to her and present her with the images he had found at work or at home. And as the Jensen's reported it to the police, they believed the culprit was Perry Tarika. Because it seemed as though the images were chosen to resemble Julie. And the frightening idea was presented that this man, Perry Tarika, had secretly taken pictures of him and Julie when they had sex that long time ago. That he had had this fling with Julie and now he was rubbing it in her face to humiliate her for years. And the police tried to investigate this. The police suggested to Julie that she keep a log of this activity. And you're going to see that she did. She kept a handwritten log. And it's actually stunning to see because it's so long. There's just page after page of this harassing activity. Because the defendant had said that these images were frequently left at his vehicle at work, the Pleasant Prairie Police Department suggested that the Jensen's hire a private investigator. Maybe that person can stake out the car and see if they catch anybody. Or they suggested placing a video camera, videotape the car and see if anyone leaves anything. But these efforts didn't work. The defendant was aware of this private investigator. And so while that private investigator was involved, nothing happened. The police also suggested putting a trace on the phone through the phone company. Remember, we're talking about the 90s, and so no caller ID. But when these traces were put on, the calls would stop. So the anonymous perpetrator could not be found that way. And so Officer Ron Cosman, he had a lot of contacts with Julie about this because of the harassment. And he was thinking about these traces. And he was thinking, well, how could these phone calls stop when we try to put these traces on? How could the perpetrator know to stop these calls? The only people who know about these traces are the Jensen's and me, the police officer. And so Ron Cosman specifically asked Julie, for the last trace that was done, he asked her not to tell the defendant. And so when the last trace is put on, and Officer Ron Cosman is checking in on that, and so he goes to Julie's house and he asks her if the calls had continued, and she said no. But Julie wasn't looking him in the eye. And so he asked her, did you tell the defendant this trace was going on? And she admitted that she had. And at that moment, Ron Cosman was frustrated with her, he said, why'd you do that? And so Julie explained, remember in her mind, this harassment is her fault. It's because of that affair. This degradation, what her husband is going through, what she's going through, it's her fault. And she said, well, after that affair, she just didn't want to keep things from the defendant. Didn't feel right not to tell him, so she told him. And it's true that the man that Julie Jensen had this affair with, he was a suspect too. But the thing is, he had never even lived in Wisconsin, and then even living in Illinois, he ended up moving away, far away, like you have to fly a plane. He ended up moving far away early on. And this harassment, again, went on for like seven years. And so it just didn't make sense. He's coming back to Wisconsin to leave these pictures around the Jensen home. It's not even a drive away. To leave these pictures at Mark Jensen's place of work, it just doesn't make sense. So you're going to see in the evidence this log that Julie kept of this harassment. And Julie Jensen ended up dying. She died on December 3rd of 1998. But this virtually constant harassment that had been going on since 1991, it slows down after June of 1998, and then it comes to a total stop after August of 1998. And you're going to hear in the evidence in this period of time that that's when the defendant gets a girlfriend. That's when his affair starts. 
Now you're also going to hear about computer evidence. And most of the computer evidence relates to the murder itself, but some of it relates to this harassment. And one thing you'll hear is that the defendant on his work computer, which was seized by the police, this is a 2002 computer, so years after the harassment, but it's still relevant for this reason. On this 2002 work computer, the defendant had an extensive collection of pornographic images. Judge, I object at this point. I'd ask for a sidebar. Why don't you guys go on the back for a second? We're going to just take care of it right away. to images of pornography unless they can somehow be connected to the images that were given, that were dropped around the house or around the work. I'm not sure how that's relevant. It's years after um, Julie Jensen's death. And unless there's a direct connection, a computer he had after her death, I don't know how that's relevant or those images would be relevant. Your Honor, may I, I'll just say this. I think it's outrageous that my, that uh, Ms. Uh, O'Neill, Ms. Niels, McNeil's opening statement was interrupted by this. Defense counsel has known for years, for years, that this evidence had been admitted at the last trial. If it was defense counsel's intention to bring a motion to exclude this evidence, that motion should have been heard by this court. We had numerous pretrial motions. There's never been any question that this evidence was going to be admitted during the course of this trial. And this evidence is clearly critically relevant to the evidence the state is going to be presenting during the course of this case. This, these 2,200 penis photos that were on the defendant's computer demonstrate a number of things. It demonstrates his odd preoccupation with the male member. It demonstrates that his level of, of offense that he took, that his wife, Julie, had had this affair with this Perry Tarika, in which she had apparently performed fellatio upon Perry Tarika, but it was something that she wouldn't do with him. These Venus photos that were left around the house for years and years and years, according to the investigating officers, including a, a detective, Ellis, who was a private detective in this matter, reflected that somebody had an enormous array of pornogra pornography that they could tap in order to find penis photos that kind of, that included a person that kind of looked like Julie and included a background that, that where they could not exclude her bedroom as being the sort, the, the place where these photos were taken. Um, there was ample testimony about this at the last trial. The relevance of the other acts evidence has already been ruled upon by the Wisconsin Court of Appeals and it's the law of the case in this matter. So to uh, interrupt this opening statement on this basis is outrageous, and the motion, the objection should be overruled, and we should continue with this opening statement. I'll let you respond briefly. Thank you, Judge. I have to object when I think there's irrelevant, inadmissible evidence being presented, and I'm going to continue to do that during witnesses, even if they testified about it last time, because this court decides what's relevant in this case. Um, unless they can connect these 2002 penis pictures the evidence prior to 1998, I don't understand how it's relevant. If the pictures that the Jensen's were receiving were of someone giving fellatio, and these are just penis pictures, again, I'm not sure how it's relevant to the death of the death of Julie Jensen. All right. Uh, what I'm going to say is the last statement by Ms. Krause would be a great statement at a closing argument because we would have had all the evidence come in and if the defense had made a motion on relevance and I had overruled it, the defense could argue, well, even though it came in, we don't think it's relevant. We're at opening statements. I don't see, 
I mean, this is not my first rodeo. I don't see a lot of objections at opening statements. And a lot of times, you know, statements are made, and then they come back to haunt the other party because that evidence was never presented. It never came in. So I just read to the ju uh, jury, opening statements are not evidence. They're an opportunity to tell you what the evidence will show. And if the state wants to bring in this evidence, I'm not going to prejudge every little bit of statement in it that's being made now and rule whether it's relevant or not. We're going to be here for three years, not five weeks. So it's not a good objection. I understand, Judge. And I you, will you have a right, but it's not a good objection. I want it noted for the record. Bring the jury back. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We are back on the record. All right, we're back on the record on the Jensen matter. The jury has returned to the courtroom. The appearances are the same. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm going to um, overrule the objection and the state can uh, continue with their opening statement. Go ahead, Ms. McNeil. So these 2002 images on the work computer, they're relevant because it shows that the defendant had an extensive collection of pornographic images that were categorized and were similar to the harassing images that were left around the Jensen residence over that period of time. Um, and I describe those images for a reason because they connect to these 2002 images found on the defendant's work computer. But that's in 2002. So let's talk about 1998. What you're going to see here is you're going to see an example of Julie's log, what she kept, what she hand wrote about this harassing activity. You'll see the date at the top there, January 19th of 1998, and what Julie Jensen described as new tactics live on the Internet. And so she's describing this harassment that is apparently occurring now with a change of tactics over the Internet. And then what I want to see, I want to show you next is what is noted on April 13th of 1998. Julie Jensen notes in this log an email that's part of the harassment. Here's the email. You'll see that it's from someone by the name of Turtle, that's the name in the email, to Mark Jensen. And then you'll see in the text of the email, um, consistent with the harassment, here's a few for Jay, so Julie, of me soft. Also a shot I took without her knowing it of a married girl in the office I'm currently doing at a nearby hotel. Attached to this email are three images, three pornographic images of nude males, and then what looks like a surreptitious image taken of a topless woman in a hotel room. And it's consistent with the harassment because here's this harasser suggesting essentially he's doing it to another woman, 
taking pictures of her secretly, which was the same implication given to Julie Jensen in the course of this harassment. And then also, again, of course, the pictures of a nude male. This email is from M. Jensen at execpc.com to M. Jensen at execpc.com with the names changed. So the way you would see this email in 1998, it would just look like it's from an anonymous person named Turtle to Mark Jensen. But the way our computer analysts can see the email, our computer analysts can see who it's from. It's an email the defendant sent to himself pretending under disguise to be, he's acting as the perpetrator of this harassment. So how do we know Mark Jensen is really the harasser? A variety of things, but this email proves it. Where else do we see the email? We see the same email address show up on the Jensen home computer. This email address, mjensen at execpc.com, is in the Jensen home computer under the name Mark Jensen. So this harassing, degrading email that's noted in Julie's log was sent by Mark Jensen to Mark Jensen under the guise of the harasser to be presented by the defendant to Julie as continued punishment for her affair. Now, years later in the spring of 1998. So that's the evidence that you're going to hear that the first time the Jensen marriage was on the rocks in the early 1990s, that Julie Jensen sought counseling and treatment. She was treated for depression. She seriously contemplated divorce and even filed for divorce in 1991. In contrast, Mark Jensen engaged in a years-long covert campaign to harass and punish his wife. So let's turn to what's happening in 1998 when the Jensen marriage was again crumbling. <clears throat> in 1998, Mark Jensen had moved jobs. He was now working as a stockbroker at a company called Stiefel Nicholas. The home base for that company was in St. Louis. And working in St. Louis as an assistant to the defendant's boss was a woman by the name of Kelly Labonte. In this case, Kelly Labonte is sometimes referred to as the motive because the defendant began having an affair with her in around September of 1998. And this was a very serious relationship because shortly after Julie Jensen's death, just in the weeks after, Kelly Labonte would come to Pleasant Prairie to visit. She would stay at the defendant's house. Soon thereafter, she moved to Wisconsin. She remained in a relationship with the defendant for years after Julie's death. She married him. She had a child with him. And they were together until about 2009 when they divorced. And part of this evidence, an important part of this evidence, the computer evidence, right here, you can see in this picture in the back here, that's the home computer. A picture of the Jensen home computer in their home in 1998. And so because we're talking about 1998, we're talking about not a, a laptop or something mobile, we're talking about a desktop computer that has its own room in the Jensen residence. This isn't in a bedroom or a room that's uh, occupied for people by other, for other reasons. There's no TV. This is the computer room, essentially. And what you're going to see is that on this computer, after it was seized by the police, the day of Julie's death, on this computer, the police found emails between the defendant and Kelly Labonte. Now, these were work emails in the sense that what the defendant was doing is he was accessing his work emails from home. 
um, which now is pretty normal to do on your cell phone or on your laptop. But back then in 1998, with dial-up internet, that was pretty sophisticated. And you're going to hear the detective in that time frame didn't even fully understand it. How are these work emails on the home computer? But that's how they were accessed. And so the detective sees these work emails, but he sees they're not just emails between coworkers. These emails are full of sexual innuendo, and it's obvious that these people, during the fall of 1998, they were in a relationship. They were having an affair, because Kelly ended up getting married, too, in that time period. In fact, in one of these emails from October of 1998, the defendant refers to Kelly Labonte as his girlfriend. And they end the emails frequently, almost all the time, with I-D-L-Y. I do love you. So within a few months after Julie Jensen's death, the police are aware of this affair, the motive. And the detective sits down with the defendant in April of 1999, so a few months after Julie's death. And as this investigation is continuing, the detective, who has seen these emails, asks the defendant about Kelly Labonte. And the defendant lies. He says before Julie's de death, they were just coworkers and friends. He had only seen her a few times. They weren't in a relationship. And even at that point, in the spring of 1999, he wouldn't describe them as dating. It's a lot of hemming and hawing about what he wanted to call them, and he certainly didn't want to admit to having this affair. Now, in this trial, I expect the undisputed evidence is going to show that the defendant was in the midst of an affair with Kelly Labonte when he killed his wife, Julie. Now, Julie was a perceptive person. And in the fall of 1998, she noticed changes in her husband. She knew that something was wrong. Something had changed after her husband had started this new job at Stiefel Nicholas. And she even suspected that maybe there was another woman. Maybe her husband was having an affair. But the proof that the police had found was on the computer. And a critical part of the evidence that you're going to hear in this case is that Julie Jensen didn't know anything about computers. Now, nowadays, that sounds almost impossible in 2023, but life was different in 1998. People did exist without computers. They had grown up without computers. If you were an adult in 1998, you'd grown up without a computer. You started your work life, no computer. No one had these little computers in their pocket. And the internet itself was in its infancy. This is dial-up internet. You can probably hear it when I say the words, hear it yelling at you. And so what you're going to hear in this case is that this internet, this incredibly slow internet, this is something that Julie Jensen never used. You're going to hear that Julie Jensen didn't have an email address. There's no evidence of her sending an email. You'll see that this computer evidence, that computer in the Jensen home, the internet was only used on that computer during times when the defendant was home. And Julie was a stay-at-home mom, so she had access to this computer all day long. But the computer analysts can tell when the internet was being accessed, the times. And they can tell that when Julie's home alone, no one's using the internet. It's only when the defendant is home, late at night, the early morning hours, when it's used during the daytime, it's on a weekend. Those are the times the internet is being used on this computer. And you're going to hear that there's also several documented times when we know from the evidence the defendant was out of town. There's no internet usage during those times. Julie Jensen did not use the computer or the internet back in 1998 when that was actually possible. You're even going to hear an anecdote from Therese DeFazio. Remember, she's the third grade teacher. You're going to hear that when Julie Jensen came to her classroom and offered to volunteer, 
Therese DeFazio thought, oh, it might be helpful. Maybe Julie can help the kids in their computer lab. And so Therese DeFazio suggested that, and Julie was like, oh, no, I don't even know how to turn on a computer. You know, Julie wanted to be helpful, but she told Therese DeFazio way back at the beginning of the school year, I really can't help with the computers. I can maybe type if someone opens a program for me, but that's it. So with proof of the defendant's affair being on the computer, Julie didn't have proof, only suspicions. She and her husband were arguing all the time, and she said when the defendant wasn't arguing with her, he basically didn't speak to her at all. Their relationship in 1998 that fall was just falling apart. And once again, as in 1990, 1991, Julie was contemplating divorce. Now, during this time period, there were a few people that Julie Jensen confided in. Particularly, you're going to hear these names a lot, particularly her neighbors, Margaret and Ted Voigt. Now, I call them Julie's neighbors, but you're going to see in the evidence that they were really more than neighbors. They were friends. They had lived next to each other for years. The Voigts also had two children who were growing up. They both spent a lot of time outside. The Voigts children would come over to play in the pool. They would see Julie outside all the time, working on the garden. They would socialize with each other. They went out to dinners. They went to places like Six Flags with their kids. They went to the, the zoo or birthday parties. So they were friends. They were more than neighbors. In fact, you're going to hear in the evidence that Julie Jensen saw the Voigts so commonly that it was basically every day. Virtually every day, they'd see each other and chat with each other. So one day, about five or six weeks before Julie died, in about late October of 1998, Ted Voigt saw Julie Jensen in the front of her house. There was a bench there, and she was sitting there, and she was crying. And Ted Voigt was getting ready for work that morning, but he saw his friend, his neighbor, crying. And so he went over to her. And this is the first of a series of conversations that Julie Jensen had with Ted Voigt about her concerns about her marriage and what was going on with the defendant. You'll hear about these conversations in detail in the evidence, but basically over the course of these five or six weeks before her death, Julie Jensen told Ted Voigt about the arguments with the defendant, how the defendant seemed changed, her worry that maybe the defendant was having an affair, and things that Julie had noticed with the defendant about the computer. She talked about going by the computer and seeing sticky notes, sticky notes that he had written by the computer that were suspicious, that had weird words on them like syringe and names of drugs. And she saw the defendant on the computer. For instance, she'd be vacuuming in the hall outside. And she saw on the screen that he was looking up poisoning and then closed the door in her face. She described another time when the defendant had gone to work but left the computer on. And on the screen, there was a website about poisoning. So now, moving to late November, going to put up here a calendar that'll help you with the days. Moving to late November in the days before Julie's death, which happened on December 3rd, Julie confided in Therese DeFazio. And this was the last time she saw De Therese DeFazio. And you'll hear Ms. DeFazio recount this conversation and how she saw that Julie was troubled and encourage Julie to speak to her. And Julie told Ms. DeFazio that she was afraid that her husband was going to kill her. Now, Ms. DeFazio was shocked, and she was taken aback, and she asked Julie why she would think something so serious. And Julie explained about that list, that weird sticky note. And then she explained 
that she feared that her husband might try to kill her with a drug overdose and make it look like a suicide. Again, Ms. DeFazio asked her why she thought her husband might do this, and Julie said there were other things that she couldn't explain. And Julie confided to Ms. DeFazio, the same as she had to Mr. Voigt, that it bothered her how every time she walked by that computer room and the defendant was in it, he would cover it or turn it off quickly so she, should, she couldn't see the screen. And then there's a third person, the defendant's sister, Laura Coster. During Julie's life, Julie and Laura Coster were good friends. So even though Laura Coster is the defendant's sister, Julie confided in her as a friend. Julie Jensen spoke to the defendant's sister about the same suspicious note, the one that listed the syringe on it, and she even told the defendant's sister. She told her in the fall of 1998 that she feared that the defendant might be planning to kill her. Now this sounds crazy, except for the fact that within a few weeks, within a few days of these conversations, Julie Jensen was dead. This sounds crazy. And that's the problem. That's the dilemma that Julie Jensen was facing. She knew it sounded crazy, and she explained it to Ted Voigt and to Therese DeFazio, that if she acted on these fears, if she did what a person who feared for their life would do, take her kids and run and hide, if she did those things, the defendant would point at her and call her crazy. Look at what my crazy wife did, running off with the kids, acting like I'm going to kill her. So here's what Ted Voigt said about Julie's dilemma. Ted Voigt said that her suspicions were that the defendant was trying to poison her or he's trying to drive her nuts to take away the kids from her because that's what the arguments that they used to have, that he was scaring her, that she was an unfit mother and he would take the kids away from her. Therese DeFazio said, that Julie told her she stayed with her husband for the sake of the boys whom she loved dearly, that she thought if she tried to leave her husband, he'd make up stories that she was unstable and that he'd get the kids. She didn't want to lose her boys. Another thing Julie had told Ms. DeFazio, going back to that prior counseling in 1990 and 1991, she had told Therese DeFazio during that counseling, the defendant would always say things that were making her look like she was crazy. Remember, this is the man who for years tricked Julie into believing that her former lover was leaving debasing pornography all around when it was actually him. These days, we have a word for this. We call it gaslighting. So let's be clear. This isn't a case where it's either a homicide or a tragic suicide. It's either a homicide or a suicide plus. A suicide plus an evil plan to frame an innocent man. That way, the kids won't just lose their mom. They'll lose their dad, too. There is one thing that is inescapably clear from the evidence, in spite of her fears that Julie expressed to multiple people before she died, Julie Jensen would not abandon her children. And so she stayed. Now, on Tuesday, December 1st, Julie Jensen went to see the family doctor, Dr. Borman. And during this visit, Julie told the doctor that she was miserable and depressed. So there it is, Julie Jensen talking about being depressed just days before her death. But she also told Dr. Borman that she and the defendant were having marital problems. She told him about the affair that she had and felt that the defendant never forgave her for. She told Dr. Borman that she's concerned her marriage might be over, and she told him several times that her kids meant everything to her. She denied being suicidal and talks about not wanting to lose her kids. 
And so we can see the parallels here to 1990. And Dr. Borman ends up referring her for counseling and giving her samples of Paxil, an antidepressant. One thing that you're going to hear in the evidence is before this visit to the doctor, the defendant was urging Julie to go see a doctor. So maybe he was just being a caring husband for his depressed wife. But this December 1st visit to the doctor was not enough for Mark Jensen. Because the next day, he went to Dr. Borman alone. This is December 2nd. And he didn't go for himself, he went for Julie. And he told Dr. Borman that he was concerned. He'd gotten some information off the internet about the side effects of Paxil. And he was concerned that Julie might be having side effects. And he was concerned because she wasn't sleeping. Now this was odd because Dr. Borman made no note about sleep disturbances the prior day, which is a common question, a question that gets all, asked all the time when dealing with depression. A symptom being sleep disturbance is a very common symptom. Without seeing Julie Jensen, without trying to call her or consult with her, Dr. Borman gave the defendant a prescription for Julie for Ambien, 10 Ambien sleeping pills. So this was sometime during the morning of December 2nd, 1998. By the time of Julie's death, a bit over 24 hours later, three of those pills were gone. And it's too bad that Dr. Borman didn't try to give Julie a call because something was wrong. The morning of December 2nd, when the defendant left the home, Julie called her friend Margaret Voigt. Now, Margaret Voigt, just like Ted Voigt, was Julie's friend. But unlike her husband, Margaret didn't really want to be involved in these troubles. She heard about all of them through her husband, but she didn't really want to get involved. So she knew about them but hadn't spoken as much to Julie as her husband had. So Julie talks on the phone with Margaret Voigt that morning, and Margaret Voigt, who knew her well, who knew her for years, said Julie's voice sounded shaky and it sounded like she was drunk. Now there's no reason for Margaret Voigt to know this, but ethylene glycol is an alcohol. And so one of the first stages of poisoning, the first stage of ethylene glycol poisoning, is a person will show signs of intoxication, like they're drunk. So Margaret asks Julie what's wrong, and Julie tells her, while well, this medication I took, I didn't know it, had, it would have such an effect on me. But Julie was happy, because the defendant was now being so attentive to her. Julie said the defendant was being good to her. He took the kids to school and, she's go and he's going to go to the doctor for her. And Margaret offered help. She asked Julie if she needed help, but Julie said no. The defendant was being good to her. Margaret Voigt never spoke to Julie Jensen again. Now these doctor visits are important because leading up to them, Julie Jensen had talked to Ted Voigt and described a strange experience where the defendant had very persistently tried to get her to drink some wine. And it just wasn't normal. These were people who had been together with each other for years. And the defendant didn't commonly offer Julie Jensen food and drink like that. She was the homemaker, that was her job, and so Julie described this unusual behavior from the defendant and how her not wanting to drink the wine had actually led to a huge fight between them. It was just another thing on the list of strange things that happened in the weeks before Julie's death. Now the defendant had this ideal drug to enact his plan Ethylene glycol has a sweet taste to it, and it's the kind of thing that won't be detected at autopsy. But he has to have a way to slip it to Julie, and being persistent and aggressive about it wasn't working. 
But now Julie's got this new medication and he's taking care of her. And these effects from this ethylene glycol can be passed off as side effects of the new medication. And once, once Julie starts getting well and truly sick from this poison, the defendant now has Ambien to give her day and night to drug her senseless. And Julie did get truly sick. On Wednesday, December 2nd, she was supposed to go to Ms. DeFazio's class. She went there every Wednesday. She was very prompt. And so when Ms. DeFazio noted she was missing, Ms. DeFazio went to her son, David, who presented her with a note that said Julie couldn't come in because she was sick. <clears throat> now, there are three stages of ethylene glycol poisoning. Someone who consumes enough eth ethylene glycol at once can die in stage one. But if they reach stage two, which is 12 to 24 hours after ingestion, the person's body becomes acidotic because the body breaks down the ethylene glycol into the poisons. And one of them is called oxalic acid. This causes breathing problems heavy, rapid breathing, and it can cause heart arrhythmia. A person can go into a coma in this stage and die. If a person does make it to stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning, which can happen 24 to 72 hours after ingestion, that's the kidney phase. You see at the autopsy crystals in someone's kidney when they reach this phase. So the doctors can tell these crystals are from that acid created by ethylene glycol poisoning. And they disrupt kidney function. A person who reaches stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning, they die a, a slow and a painful death. At approximately 4.30 p.m. on December 3rd of 1998, the police responded to the Jensen residence for a pulseless, non-breathing female. Julie Jensen was dead in her bed. The crystals in Julie Jensen's kidneys found after her autopsy show that she had reached stage three of ethylene glycol poisoning before she died. I don't think that there's going to be any dispute in the evidence that Julie Jensen was desperately ill leading up to her death. It's consistent with the medical evidence and the defendant himself acknowledged it. He said she was breathing funny. She had a hard time breathing. She got up and she fell and she hit her head. The morning of her death, she could hardly sit up in bed. She was groggy, almost incoherent, her breathing was labored and raspy. It sounded like her windpipe was being restricted. The defendant said, I'm not even sure she was coherent. The defendant also adamantly said that that morning she did not get out of bed. So now we go to the sleeping pills. The thing about sleeping pills is you're supposed to take them when you're supposed to be sleeping. And the defendant described Julie Jensen taking the first one Wednesday morning, right after he got them, and then another one Wednesday night, and then a third one Thursday morning, the morning of her death, when she was so terribly ill she was incoherent. The defendant even describes how that morning, he talked about Julie Jensen, he, she couldn't even choke down water. And she didn't get the water because she didn't get out of bed. He had to get it for her. So Julie Jensen didn't take a sleeping pill the morning of December 3rd. She was given a sleeping pill. She couldn't get out of bed. The defendant gave it to her. And the children saw their mother dying too. David was upset. He didn't want to go to school. He noticed his mom's breathing problems. David said she couldn't talk that morning. And the defendant said something weird to the detective who was talking to him about that morning. He said, 
There was a question between myself and the kids that morning about whether or not to call an ambulance, take her to the hospital. The kids are eight and three. You don't consult with an eight-year-old and a three-year-old about taking your wife who can't breathe to the hospital. And also, Dr. Borman, who had given her that prescription, given the defendant the Ambien, he had told the defendant, if your wife's condition worsens, you got to get her to the ER. But Mark Jensen didn't listen to Dr. Borman or his kids, for that matter. What the defendant said he did was that afternoon, the afternoon of December 3rd, he said he went to work. So now we come to a witness by the name of Aaron Dillard. And before I talk about what Aaron Dillard ha has to say, I want to talk about who Aaron Dillard is. He became a witness because he was someone in 2007 who was in the same area of the jail as Mark Jensen. Aaron Dillard is a liar and he is a con man. Aaron Dillard is willing to provide information, testimony about Mark Jensen to help himself, to help himself in the outcome of his criminal cases. So why call this lying con man as a witness, someone who everyone acknowledges is a liar? Well, what Aaron Dillard has to say is that while he was in jail with the defendant, the defendant told him what happened about killing his wife. And now again, I cannot be more clear that Aaron Dillard is not an inherently believable witness. He's the opposite. But what Aaron Dillard had to say is eye-opening. Because the only people who know what happened in the last moments of Julie Jensen's life, well, it's only one person, the person who was there, the defendant. And up until this point, up until 2007, a lot of people had spent a lot of time thinking about this case, law enforcement and medical examiners. In this case, we're actually going to be calling two medical examiners as witnesses. You're going to hear from Dr. Chambliss, who actually did the autopsy on Julie Jensen, and Dr. Mainland, who studied the case and ethylene glycol poisoning. And there were some unexplained things about this case. For instance, how Julie Jensen was found in her bed. She was found face down in her pillow to such an extent that you're going to see that her nose was actually shifted to the side. A very odd position for someone to be in who couldn't breathe. Also, she was laying awkwardly across her arm. So her arm was kind of beneath her diagonally an odd position for someone to put themselves in. It looks like someone had simply rolled her over from her back to her face. And part of what happens is in an autopsy is that the doctors look for internal injuries. And there was some internal subcutaneous bruising on Julie's rib cage that aligned with how she was laying on her arm. And she also had some hemorrhages in the back of her neck area. <clears throat> now, when someone's doing an autopsy, deciding that the manner of death is asphyxiation, that's often a decision that is based on excluding everything else. You have a person who's dead, and you can't say other ways that they died, but you see some signs of asphyxiation. So different maybe from strangulation, where there's actual force applied to someone's neck, but asphyxiation, where someone's breathing is stopped, like by forcing their face into a pillow. It's not going to leave the same signs. <clears throat> and so sometimes these signs can just be things that are seen, post-mortem artifacts that are seen, and they aren't signs of asphyxiation. But they are also consistent with someone who is su suffocated. And so this leads us to what Aaron Dillard says the defendant told him. The defendant had a timing problem. He needed Julie Jensen to die on December 3rd before he got David from school. 
He could not bring his eight-year-old, who had already been wanting to take that take his mother to a doctor. He couldn't bring that eight-year-old back in the home where his mother was dying but not dead yet. So if Julie Jensen was alive by the time David Jensen was done with school, that was a problem for the defendant. And what Aaron Dillard said is that the defendant, he took the kids to school and to daycare, which is true. <clears throat> and the defendant returned home but Julie Jensen was not dead. She was non-responsive, she was incoherent, but the defendant feared that she was actually breathing better. And so he first rolls her onto her face with her face in the pillow, and then he leaves the room, kind of hoping that that will do the job. But when the defendant returned to the room, Julie Jensen was still alive. And so he got on top of her, he pushed her face and her neck into a pillow, he sat on her back so she could not breathe, causing the pressure on her arm that she was laying on, causing the subcutaneous bruising, and then she died. That is the description that Aaron Diller tells of what Mark Jensen told him. And there's other significant details that Aaron Dillard gives, details about the medications getting the Paxil, how the defendants, his plan was to slip her antifreeze and juice when she's taking this medication. How Julie was acting drunk. The defendant apparently told Aaron Dillard that Julie was acting drunk. And then also getting the Ambien to sedate Julie. Now I want to be clear that Julie Jensen, untreated, and she was untreated, would have died of ethylene glycol poisoning. So it is that poisoning what this case is truly about. But the significance of Aaron Dillard is not that he is a truth teller, but he's also not a doctor, he's not a toxicologist, he's not a forensic pathologist or a detective, and he certainly can't speak to the dead. And the way Aaron Dillard was able to give details to explain some of the unexplained things in this case was eye-opening, even to people who had thought about the case for a long time. And not being a doctor or a medical examiner or a psychic, the only way Aaron Dillard could do that is if he heard it from the mouth of the defendant. But Aaron Dillard is not the only person the defendant talked to. You heard about Kelly Labonte being referred to as Mark Jensen's motive. Now it's time to get to Mark Jensen's mistake. And that person is Ed Klug. Ed Klug is Mark Jensen's mistake because on a drunken night, the defendant revealed to Ed Klug before Julie's murder that he was looking on the computer for ways to kill his wife. Mark Jensen knew Ed Klug because they both had moved to Stiefel Nicholas in 1998. Mark Jensen had joined the firm earlier and he was actually involved in helping open Ed Klug's branch in Appleton. In fact, Kelly Labonte was there too. And so Mark Jensen actually wasn't so helpful in opening that branch according to what Ed Klug saw. And so then they know each other from that and they end up together at a big conference. You're gonna hear about this conference that took place in St. Louis in early November of 1998, so before Julie's death, the big company conference. And Mark Jensen and Ed Klug, they know each other, but they both recently joined this company, so they don't know a bunch of people. And so they end up hanging out in the hotel and at first they are with a bunch of people drinking, but then the hotel clears out. It's basically even past bar close time. And they've been drinking together and talking, and they engage in some wife bashing, so to speak. And so during this conversation, when Mark Jensen had been drinking, the defendant told Ed Klug that if you want to get rid of your wife, that you could go to websites that would tell you how to poison your wife, how to kill her, 
and it wouldn't be detectable. You could use things like Benadryl and antifreeze, things that couldn't be detected. And the way Ed Klug describes it is that Mark Jensen was telling him about a substance that would crystallize someone from the inside out, which is what ethylene glycol does. Ed Klug said Mark Jensen was telling him how he was doing this on the computer and how he was going to kill his wife. So Ed Klug is a big problem for the defendant in this case. And so I think you're likely to hear in the evidence a lot of efforts to attack Ed Klug. That maybe he's someone who just wants the limelight, just wants to insert himself into a big case. But what you're going to hear is that Ed Klug actually never came forward with this information to the police or prosecutors. We had to go to him because one of his coworkers suggested, you go talk to Ed Klug. He has some things to say about Mark Jensen. So not someone who's seeking the limelight. And also, I expect you'll hear as a witness from Joanne Klug. Because it might be said that, well, if Ed Klug didn't report this information right away, in fact, not until 2007, then how do we even know it actually happened? And this is where Joanne Klug comes in. Joanne is Ed's ex-wife now. They were married back in 1998, and actually until years later. But they're not married now, and their marriage was not in great shape in 1998, hence the wife bashing. So that night at the conference, Joanne was checking in on her husband. And that night after this conversation happened, there's a variety of phone calls between Ed Klug and Joanne Klug. And Joanne Klug will come in here and tell you that that very night, Ed Klug told her, hey, remember Mark Jensen, my coworker Mark Jensen? He said he's looking for ways to kill his wife including with antifreeze. So we know right after the fact that Ed Klug, in surprise and shock, told somebody about this conversation. He told his wife then, now his ex-wife. <clears throat> so when the defendant is contemplating this murder, after he was drinking with his guard down, the defendant told Ed Klug about this internet research on websites. And the computer evidence in this case tells you that's exactly what the defendant was doing. Remember that Jensen home computer I showed you the picture of? That was seized by the police and examined by experts from the Wisconsin Department of Justice. And you're going to hear a lot of evidence about this computer because of how important that is. But to try, try to boil it down for you, what you'll see in this computer evidence is the research into websites about poisoning and then specifically ethylene glycol poisoning. Now that research was being done in 1998 in the infancy of the internet. And what's fascinating is that in this computer that was analyzed, by the Department of Justice, you can sometimes even see what those websites look like in 1998. The computer saved that information. And there's no Googling even at that time. For a search engine, you're going to see Yahoo. And you can see this information. It was able to be recovered, even though the user of the computer, the defendant, deleted the internet history. So nowadays, people live and work on computers every day. People are cognizant of privacy. There's things like private browsers and VPNs. But that, back then, it was quite an unusual thing to delete the internet history. And that's what this user, this sophisticated user of the computer did repeatedly. We're only able to see this internet history because of the analysis by the professionals. If a user were simply to open this computer, if it could still turn on even after 1998, and just try to look at the internet history, you wouldn't see anything. 
And I already told you about Julie's inability to use a computer, and the defendant was quite the opposite. You're going to hear from the defendant's co-worker, a man named Dave Naring, who was his friend from work. And he's going to tell you that during this time period, the defendant was very skilled at the computer. He was on the computer all the time at work. Remember, we don't see a single email from Julie Jensen. In contrast, we see a bunch of emails involving the defendant. We can also compare the internet history we see on this home computer with things that we know were going on in the defendant's life. For example, the defendant imagined going on a Windstar cruise with his girlfriend, Kelly Labonte. The internet history shows a visit to the Windstar cruise website. The defendant, in an email, he's offering to buy Kelly Labonte some clothes from Patagonia. On the home computer, we see that online shopping at Patagonia. The defendant is thinking about ways to kill his wife. We see those searches on the home computer. Initially, for a wider variety of ways to kill someone, like pipe bombs, there's even a website accessed with a story about a man trying to kill his wife, his ex-wife, with a pipe bomb. Or we see research on the anarchist cookbook, websites that have to do with like messing with the wiring of a pool to electrocute someone. Now that's the early research. And then we see the research for poisons. And finally, for ethylene glycol poisoning. And again, this aligns with the e emails that we have between the defendant and his girlfriend, his future wife, Kelly Labonte. They start talking about the possibility of a future together, how they're going to deal with their significant others in October of 1998. And we start seeing this research on the computer about killing and poisoning. Now, interestingly, we don't see research about divorce or child custody or child support. We don't see internet activity that overlaps with Julie's interests, what was going on in her life. We don't see internet activity at all when the defendant isn't there. From the evidence, we know that the person doing this internet research, this hidden, deleted internet research, that's the person who killed Julie Jensen. And we know from the evidence that that person was not Julie. It was the defendant. Remember how desperately ill Julie was the morning of her death. She was incoherent. She was struggling to breathe. She did not get out of bed. She couldn't walk, she couldn't talk. She was on her third Ambien pill in about 24 hours. Her eight-year-old knew that she needed to go to the hospital. The defendant was there. As Julie lay dying, did he take her to the hospital or call 911 like his son wanted or like Dr. Borman told him? No, that's when he gave her the sleeping pill. And as Julie lay dying that morning of December 3rd, 1998, he went to the computer room, and that morning, he searched for ethylene glycol poisoning. You can see the search term on the bottom of the screen here. This is Julie Jensen. She didn't kill herself. She didn't frame her husband to make it look like a homicide. She didn't abandon her kids and try to take away their father too. She lived for her kids and she died because the defendant murdered her. Thank you. We're gonna take a short break before the uh, defense does their opening. So go in the back, relax. Please don't talk about the case, okay? Thank you. <laughs> 